this morning we are privileged and blessed to have our beloved Padre. And uh, he happened to be our host. He is, you know, all the glory you see here, you can see it reflecting in him. Hallelujah! So, without wasting his time, because I know that um, it's going to, you know, please relax. There is really nothing to, to the, 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 this is us and that. This is family business. The environment is right for it. So, let us welcome, oh, I haven't finished introducing you. <laughs> Family, let us welcome our beloved pastor, Padre Bruce. Oh, I've lost that already. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Padre, let us uh, welcome our beloved Padre on. Let him take us. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. <laughs> hey, you should have blown the shop. Never mind. There appears to be a, a high chance of me crying because there's two boxes of tissues out the front. Um, wow. I, I didn't know that that's what I was going to be asked to do, make people cry. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I was trying to work out how many years it's been since we've stood here together and started this. Uh, I was trying to work out how many years it's been since we were able to do this in person. Um, three? Three years. And I must admit that the impact of Rebecca's uh, stylizing had, had that impact had drifted away until the last two days where she and her team have worked tirelessly to make this place feel like the throne room of a king. So, thank you so much. I also haven't seen so much technology in this place, ever. And that, you could put all the technology from history that's been in this place and it still would look like a transistor radio compared to the amount of work that these guys and their team have done. So give them some appreciation. We're also trialling about 300 cameras in here. So I hope you signed your declaration of um, permission and if you're um, in the country illegally... Time to, time to you know, change your passport uh, because they're going to find you. Uh, this is also being streamed how many places? Uh, three, places. three different places. So, so there's going to be a lot of other people, if you like, emotionally, spiritually, literally, uh, listening and enjoying and going on the journey of what we're trying to do here as well. And what we generally find is our numbers physically just start to grow over the over the days so you're allowed to mention this to your friends and family if you want to you're allowed to say to them hey come along enjoy uh, one of the things that we uh, that we love to do is talk about what we enjoy together uh, the, I enjoy and this is probably a little bit moves from the head to the tummy uh, I enjoy the food I enjoy the fellowship <laughs> I, I remember coming, and I get a bit cooked in a crowd, and Ruben will confirm that, uh, but I remember coming back once, just around dinner time, after having done the whole morning and starting to bounce off the walls, coming back at dinner time, and, the, and there was just this family sense in the hall, as kids were running around, and there was just warmth and generosity, it's going to make me cry already, I haven't even got to my message. Um, yeah. And so uh, well, I suppose I want to say to you, have, maybe even have an expectation of the warmth and generosity that all of the ones here that are, are putting effort, if you like, into saying this is a moment for you to rest, to soak, to enjoy, to maybe have a shift of your heart and mind. But mostly we're called, and you know, our mandate is, as Luke was reminding us, our mandate is 
is a multiple layer of love. It is to be loved by God first would be my suggestion because you can't give away what you don't have. Yeah? And then to just let that bubble over you and, and for me it softens my edges. It, it certainly is a blessing to me and helps me. Uh, in the days uh, before, I've been sitting and listening to Dad and just saying, hey, you know, I want something really smart to say. Do you know what it's like? You want something that's going to set the atmosphere. And, and there was one word that stood out, and that was reformation. Now, reformation, because I did church history, reformation was like they talk about seasons in history, and they talk about it within the church as... Uh, as the institutional churches of the past. So there's been, you know, Protestant Reformation, Catholic Reformation, uh, Pentecostal Reformation. But I actually want to talk to you about uh, the notion of Reformation as personal rather than some institutional corporate thing. And I want to suggest to you that Reformation probably needs to be broken down to reformation. And the reformation idea for me as I was thinking about this was being reformed as I was originally intended. Amen. So, so I'm not being transformed into something I'm not. I'm being reformed into who God says and has says and has made me to be. Because if I'm made in his image, he doesn't want to form me into something else. The reality for me is, in most cases, is that life without uh, the blessing of God's direction and wisdom has left me malformed into something I'm not. And so I hope for you, as we spend this time, that in whatever needs for you, in whatever the father says, my son, my daughter, is missing out on who they could be, who they really are, is that their reformation would draw you back to who the father says you are. And, and it'll be different for all of us. And we'll be at different stages of that journey. Um, but I hope that that is true for you. I like the, um, you know the passage that talks about we will move from glory to glory? I like that one. Um, but I often have misunderstood, thank you my friend, I often have misunderstood what that means. This appears to have a flat battery, just so you know. No, it's not. There's no battery signal on it. Doesn't need it. That screen's broken. Hallelujah. Um, well, that fills me with confidence. Oh, <laughs> I'll assume it's going to work. I'm not sure that's true. I'm, I think I just said it. <laughs> I don't think it will, but I really hope it does. That idea of glory to glory, I heard someone say once, and this is not my talk, it's the introduction, just so you know, because I've got 10 minutes to introduce today, uh, and so this is atmosphere setting. I've heard someone say that glory is grace triumphant. And grace is glory militant. Glory is grace triumphant. Grace is glory militant. In other words, the grace of God has come in to fight for us. And when the victory is won, we reflect the glory of God. That fight won. So in the, in the advancement, if you like, of glory to glory... That's the increase of God's love, his grace, achieving its intended purpose, resetting you to your design and destiny, which is to look like dad and to act like dad, to love like dad because you're already whole. So I don't know on the spectrum of grace and glory what you need. But isn't it wonderful Dad does and Holy Spirit does? So if you need grace over these days, may you find more than you could ask or imagine. And if you need to start to step into the glory of who you are because of grace, may you do that with a level of humility because it was all his work, which we just get to walk in freely, don't we? I've got about three other comments, but I just realised that I think I've used my time <laughs> of introduction. I, I want to invite you to just pray with me. Not because uh, we haven't prayed already, just it's good to talk to Dad about what we want. 
So, Father, uh, we just thank you that you are who you are, that you never change. You meet us where we are, knowing that we probably need to change. But you love us where we are. So today, we come as we are, knowing that you accept us, knowing that your love isn't changed for us by our level of need for grace or expression of glory. And we just thank you that today, like always, you will speak to us and your words are life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I get to remind us about our foundation. And our foundation is simple. Everything we do and say comes from our identity. And our identity is not a servant of God. We are sons who serve. We're not servants working for approval. I'm used to that. It's an Anglican church. We're all quiet. We, we all, that, that's when you turn up. Uh, so your change up is in your hands. Mine, I'm doing my bit. <laughs> you do your bit. So we are royalty. We're sons and daughters of the king. Our, so we're sons and daughters of our f- heavenly father, true? And Jesus says, call my dad your dad. Say our father. So we know that we're sons and daughters of dad. Now, don't try and drag me back into the old covenant because I'll just want to demolish that like Jesus did. So I'm just really happy not to live in that space. And if you need me to, you're talking to the wrong Bruce uh, because this one doesn't have a space for that. But your father happens to be the king. And because he's the king, and then we know from who it says Jesus is, king of kings, who do you think the other kings are just as a clue? Yeah, yeah. So when we sing King of Kings, we haven't worked out. We thought they were singing about Prince Charles, King of Prince Charles and whoever it is in Nepal and whatever else. It actually was us. And it was only the other day that I realised that what that meant. Now, the reality check in the midst of all that is that like in any family, there's a growing process where we start as little kids with the benefit of the family, but none of the authority. And very little power to exercise anything, but all of the protection and provision. Is that right? And I think there's something... So for me, that's very true in the kingdom. And so there's a maturing process. It talks about Jesus growing in favour. Why would he have to grow? He was Well, because he came like us to show us what us looks like as we grow. So he's our example. And so there's a reality for that reformation that we need to mature. We need to set our hearts and minds on things above so that we're not thinking about it from a natural or an earthly position, but from a kingdom perspective. And that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our recipe for life is that word. How does life work for you? And, And we're told that we can have the mind of Christ, that recipe for life the ingredients and the method in which you put it into place. We're told we can have, we have complete access to the mind of Christ. So how to live like a son or daughter of God, because that's who he was. So in the context of all this, that's going to help us to go on that journey of being reformed to the destiny, to the identity, to the assignment, to the divine identity that we're designed to have. It's going to reset us, but I've got to tell you, here's where that wonderful ingredient, which most of us would say, God, just come and change my heart. And he goes, like, which God are you talking to? Because I've got, I'm the one of free will. I gave you your heart, and, and I need you to change your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you, poke you, prod you, annoy you for the rest of your life. In your waking and in your sleeping dreams. He's going to do it even more through your friends who are believers to just going to annoy the daylights out of you. Or maybe the dark lights out of you. Maybe that's how it should be said. Because Holy Spirit is so committed to you becoming all you're designed to be. Because it says he guides you into all truth. So let's just hand on our hearts, say, come do it again. Come do it again. Who knows we're in an 
ongoing living relationship, not a relationship of historical, historical information, which we may have not got, got a transformation from, that we often need to be refreshed and renewed with the same experience, but at a different level. Because we want to be, as it says, established. There's a, the, the word of God is really precious about being established, being established on the truth, which means that's what you're rooted and grounded in. It means this is what you, if you like, like a tree, find your life source from. And so we're doing the foundation of sonship because nothing in the kingdom works without it. So I need just to say, nothing works without sonship. Now, I really only believe Reuben about it at this stage because he's the only one I could hear. Hand on your heart. Now, you may not believe this, so I don't want you to say what you don't believe. But if you do believe it, say it like you mean it. Nothing works without sonship. And if you're not able to say that, by the time I'm finished my little chat and this weekend, you will. I guarantee it. Now, let me, um, let me just go through, add some slides to this experience. And if you're watching, I hope you can see these. One of the slides has a little video in it which will require audio. That wasn't for your benefit. That was for the corner with the multiple technical levels in it, uh, which I uh, don't understand at all. Uh, I'm, I'm just assuming they're listening, although that could be a big assumption. He is. He is. Good lad. All right. So it does work even though the screen's broken. Hallelujah. Identity... Now, this is supposed to come on in steps, not all in one slide. It's meant to have click, 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 click. You don't do transitions. You don't do those wonderful PowerPoint technology things. You took them all out? He did. He said kinder. That is not helpful. Hard work to, it was hard work to get him in there, and you taking them all out is not helpful, just so you know. So, so I like the element of surprise. He's been on night watch. I was here. What, he's going to change them all? <laughs> all right. Yeah, I don't know what you did to that to make me a lot darker than I... What happened to that? No, no, mine was white. Just like me. Like, needs a bit of sun. Just like me. <laughs> I met with a friend the other day, and he's, he's white, and he looked at me and said, wow, you've had a bit of sun. And I'm looking, thinking, yeah, I think I had three hours of it the other day. That's all it took just to take the edge off. No, didn't work. All right. Well, we'll go with that. Identity is the foundation of everything. It's built upon. Identity is not your role or your position which is so annoying, it really is. Oh, like has anybody here worked really hard to get a qualification or, or a um, experience? You've worked your way up the food chain, the pecking order, the ladder where people stand on your head to get to the point where you have a bit of authority and power and influence because the role is everything. To find out it's not worth a cracker. And at the top of the ladder is worse than the bottom. Yeah. Role is not your identity. And sadly, it won't fulfill you. Yeah. Now, I, I think for most people they, they, who've been through that process, I have. I've done Bible college twice. I've done youth minister. I've done outreach minister. I've done church minister. And getting to the pointy end of the stick in any of those roles was the worst end of the stick as a role as an identity marker, which is half the time why I say to people, please don't introduce me as Reverend Bruce Ollington. Could I just be Bruce? Because my heavenly father is happy with that. The other title is a job I do in the midst of the family, but it's not the best title I have, which is a child of God. It's just, a, it's just an observation. My achievements, as much as, like I find a bit of joy in them, I do find a joy in the breakthroughs of getting an achievement done and persevering. I used to be really good at starting things and really bad at finishing them. So I was a great starter and a poor finisher. And uh, someone told me, stop starting and start finishing. And when they first told me that, 
first time it came out of my mouth, I went, stop, stop, start, stop starting and what do you, stop, I couldn't even say it, matter do it. But I realised it's okay to finish something. So, in the dynamic of this family, I am lucky enough, fortunate enough, to... And, and to be honest, if, if it wasn't for the massive... You know how I said Holy Spirit will get people to annoy you until you do what you're designed to do? The person laughing in the room knows why I'm saying that. And it, he knows why, because he was so annoying. See, he's innocent now. But he was back there in the background. So the last conference that we had in this building, I had a PDF version of my book available to sell because the printed version was, I don't know, on the boat or wherever it was, it wasn't ready. And to be honest, outside of my, without my wife, just doing the same thing at home, for a totally different reason, and without this family saying, when are we going to get the treasure of what you've been blabbing about in an accessible resource so we can use it. And so it was available in PDF version for that. And during lockdown, a truck came in the driveway and unloaded some boxes. And it was such an exciting time. And it was a point of finishing an achievement. <laughs> ah. And I've got to tell you, I was really proud of it until I realised it wasn't mine. It wasn't mine. It wasn't my book. It was his. It was Dad taking me on a four-year journey of telling me who I am and then doing the freely you've received, freely give. Do the work to multiply, which is another key to kingdom and kingdom families. So has anyone here not got my book? Put your hand up if you don't have my book. Has anyone not got my You, I saw your hand go up first. Right through there. Could you pass that book to her? <laughs> that journey of realising that I, I had been given a gift has been the most transformational thing that's ever happened to me. Because all of the other information I'd received over years of training and studying and and ministering and work and serving the Lord for recognition. <laughs> serving the Lord. <laughs> Normally I say I'm not a recording, I can't do repeat, rewind, play, but just for you once you can have it. No, that was for you. It's not about your performance. I remember being at Bible college and, and it was about performance and doing the Greek language. And the Greek language, um, for those of you who have done the Biblical Greek, anyone here done Biblical Greek at Bible College? Yes. Oh, you are a Greek. That doesn't count. <laughs> oh, fine. It's easy for you. You probably knew how the alphabet before you started. Same for you. It was, it's street Greek. It's like Aussie slang. You imagine there's a book just for Aussie slang and all the real English isn't included. This is what Biblical Greek is. It's street Greek. It's, it's the bar house, port, um, trading room, tradie site Greek. It's not Greek as you know it in the language today. So I go to Bible college and I've been in ministry for years and I've done one Bible college before and I turn up and there, there's a level where I feel like I should be able to handle this. Little did I know. Which was proved very soon um, at, at the assessment processes of Greek. And um, just imagine a full year of Greek studies and um, the book Wenham and all the tests and the memory cards and all the different things to do to try and just remember anything for that matter. Um, and finding out a third of the way through the year, third, just a third, that even if you got 100% for every test from that day forward, you would still fail. That's how badly you'd done. And realising that... To, to get your degree so that you could get to get the title of reverend, not who would want that, but anyway, to get that title, you would have to pass Greek. And to have that realisation of achievement, failure. And then to realise how much you'd invested in that outcome as the value of who you are. 
And what if your identity has nothing to do with your achievements? And at that stage, I really felt it did. Now, some of you may be relating to some of these things, and I want you to take a mental note, if you are, because it'll be helpful. Because the breakthrough for us is when we can see the difference. It's not, I hope you're entertained a little bit by my stories, and if I do enough stupid antics and Ruben asked me to repeat it because I could be on film forever so they, they can post it and then other people ask me about it, and then I go, yeah, I think, yeah, I, think I did do that. <laughs> yeah? But achievements are not your identity. They're not your value. They're just things you've done. Now, are they worth something? Absolutely. But if without identity reformation, they're worth nothing because when you lose them, you feel like you're nothing. Look at all the pe- men who work and study and do professional careers who then retire and die within six months because they have no identity other than the role they were doing and the achievements they made. It's a bit tragic. It's a scary statistic. It's not your success or failure. Not that you shouldn't pursue being successful. Not that you should ever let failure stop you because apparently you'll fail more than you succeed to get to the point of success. And if success is your motivator, you'll give up because you'll fail more than you succeed, which then feels like a failure as well, like just ratio. But if your identity is secure and you're like a son or daughter in the father's house and it's like when a little child is learning to ride their push bike, They fall off more than they stay on. They crash into things. They demolish the bike. They have training wheels. They have parents with aching backs running along behind them, holding them up, pushing them along. Like, to be honest, if all of their experiences about, should I keep doing this, if their decision was decided around that, they wouldn't do it after the first day. So it's not about success. It's about what am I designed for? What's my capacity? And will I pursue until I get there? And sons and daughters have that freedom with God to pursue our destiny, not because of success or failure, because of love and destiny. You're designed for this. So, sonship identity is the best kept secret of the churches that I've been in. Not this one, but it's certainly the best kept secret of the church that I've been in through history. Um, Not that I'm that old, that I should be qualified for history. I'm getting there. Um, But I never heard it. I just never heard it. So it became that um, milestone I I felt like I had to have. Now, to put it in context, I don't have an amazing relationship with my own father. So being a son wasn't something that was highly treasured for me as a person or as an individual. So performance was. So you replace it with something that's an imitation. Something gives you a feeling of some value. Because if you don't get it, you still want it because you're designed for it. And, but if you're a son or daughter in the family of God, you couldn't be any more loved than you already are. You can proudly put your hand up and say, I have failed at 80% of the things I've done. And God couldn't love me more today than he did yesterday, than he will tomorrow. And I have been successful at failing. I have achieved no roles. I have no significance or influence in the world. Even my dog won't listen to me. And God still loves me as much as he's ever going to. And if you can't say it and mean it, you don't have it. And it's not a problem that you don't have it. It's a problem if you hear this and stay there. Don't let it reform you. Now, here's the challenge. We're like, our souls, is like an iceberg. You can hear a whole heap of good things here, and you will. And you will mentally and cognitively agree. But the conditioning of your heart, your soul, has been designed by God to conform and go into autopilot with the things you make agreement with. So it's designed to make an agreement, to conform, to adhere, and then charge on with that automatically preset as your internal GPS to get to destinations. You don't even have to ask. It'll just do it. But if what's been put in there is one of the lies from the top, 
It'll keep doing that even if you say, I'm a son and daughter of God. I'm a son and daughter of God. I'm a real failure. I feel like rubbish. But they said I must say I'm a son and daughter of God. So on the outside, I'll pretend. And God loves you to be integrated. So what's in your heart and what's in your mind need to be the same. And so part of the journey of today, if you're going to go on reformation, is it's a heart reformation. And it's not a criticism It's to allow Holy Spirit to come in. And generally speaking, he will come in and he'll, well, be like Reuben, annoying. Sorry, that's, no, I just feel like I'm just picking on you. Be like, would you like to be the annoying one? No, it's him? Okay. Be like, (laughs) no, in the best possible way, because he is uh, probing, pushing, um, looking for my best. And that's what Holy Spirit's trying to do. Now, it may irritate you because you want a life of peace. And and if your journey has been success and achievement and identity and roles and it hasn't worked out great, then you haven't got a great list of success, you haven't got a lot of peace, so you just want to hide and your world gets smaller until you've got enough people that just agree because you're sick and tired of it all because you just want to avoid how you feel because how you feel is controlled by what's in the bottom half of the iceberg which is those heart culture things which are the GPS settings of the truths that have been formed by the lies of this world. What we want to do is get in and reset the GPS but to do that we have to identify it. Now you might say but Bruce that sounds like psychology. And we're good Christians and we are, ooh, psychology, ooh, we don't do that. And then you wouldn't understand the words psychology because the word psychology comes from psych, psycho, not psycho, <laughs> but psycho, which is from the Greek and in the biblical languages is soul. Anology is words, soul words. So whatever the words are in your soul, you're guided by, like your GPS setting. So I actually want God to deal with my psychology. You can do what you like with yours. How's that working for you? Is it leading you to the point of a secure son and daughter? And here's the beauty of this particular season that we're doing here. We don't want to just be princes in the family. We want to get into that phrase of heading towards that phrase of king of kings. Do you know what I mean? And that's for girls as well, just to add it to the equation. We're not just talking about boys. We're talking about princes and princesses kings and queens in the language of the family it's just the biblical culture was patriarchal at the time and it was all about inheritance read my book if you want to have the explanation for that i don't want to have to say it again it's the best treasure hidden in plain sight i've been tripping over the passages in scripture that talk about i am a son of god we've sung it Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Like this is an old chorus. Sorry, guys, for inflicting that upon you. (laughs) That we should be called the sons of God. We've been singing this for generations. It's even in Be Thou My Vision. It's everywhere. It's in the book. It's in the songs. And we have been, be a servant of God which is your identity, you can't do anything more than work for approval, because that's what a servant does. Good luck with that. So today, I'm going to move to a soft entry into sonship, because those of you who have sat in the atmosphere of um, Project 61 and Atmosphere 12 will already have heard about sonship, probably once or two or three thousand times. Um, And some of you will have read the book and are fully loaded and blessed and on the journey from prince to king. But others may not be there, and I need to give you a soft entry. So I'm going to use a kid's story. Don't say I'm childish, even though you're right. (laughs) Don't say I'm childish. This thing doesn't work at all. You took my other picture out. You really are messing with my slides. No. No. It's a picture of, I'll just tell you, here, just imagine, close your eyes, don't worry about that a lot, close your eyes and imagine a little lion cub, little pretty little, goody little cubby, goody, are you there? Shut your eyes, I said. (laughs) What's wrong with you people? See, it was there. I know it wasn't going to be black in between. 
Look at the cutie little. And inside all of us all is the king. Now, I happen to be a big fan of um, the Lion King. Now, I'm, I'm not saying it's a biblical thing, but there's enough in there for me to use as a springboard for it. I don't think there was a subtext of Bible passages around it, but I wouldn't be surprised if whoever wrote it believed in God. Just so you know. So I'm not saying it's the Bible, so don't go sending wicked emails to Reuben because he's taking all the complaints. Reuben, say, Papa Luke's taking all the positive things and Matthew's taking all the donations <laughs> and Rebecca's looking for a rest on the sofa because she's worked so hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you get all the complaints. So I have a little trailer for The Lion King which sets the story for those of you who may not have seen it who have been living in a box for the last 40 years. Uh, where's the video? I literally have a list of which slides do what. I am the user, so... We're all connected in the great circle of life. Walt Disney Pictures presents its all-new 30-second full-length animated motion picture, The Lion King. He was born to rule. This will all be mine? Everything the light touches. But a shadow lies over the kingdom. I will be king. Run away and never return. No! Hey, hey, what's he? I don't want to talk about it. He looks blue. I'd say brownish gold. No, no, no. I mean, he's depressed. Anything we can do? Not unless you can change the past. He grew up hoping to leave his old life behind. I know who you are. You're Mufasa's boy. You're the king. King? Have you got your lion's claws? You know my father? Correction. I know your father. He died. A long time ago. Nope. Wrong again. <laughs> He's alive. And I'll show him to you. Father? You are my son. And the one true king. You see, he lives in you. You must take your place in the circle of life. Simba! It's a legendary tale. I'm going to use some of the images just to remind you of different steps that are there and just talk about some basic principles. Um, hopefully that will... So why do, why do our adults use children's stories with other adults? Because that's about their mentality level, is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, it's because... And I'm be, so I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm going to tell you right up front. It's because we're just old kids. I'm just an old kid. I'm, I'm not a... Well, you've got to be an adult. As soon as I started to become an adult, I didn't even like me. Um, why would anybody else? Um, we're all the children of God. It never says you'll be the child of God. Eventually you'll grow up to be the adult of God and then you'll be so boring and pointless that nobody will listen to you. It just says you're the children of God. It, like, here's, who knows, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. There's, what, is it, what does it say? The fullness of joy is in the Lord. If you have no joy, guess how far away from him you are. Now, that doesn't mean the foolishness of the, or the childish. It's childlike. And there's a fullness of... Now, it's not entertainment and it's not pretend. It's a richness from in here. It's uh, an undercurrent of overwhelming... That's good, I like that. It's an undercurrent of overwhelming. Well, I wasn't, it's not written anywhere, I've just thought of it. That's why I know it's dad. And it's, you know, have you ever heard the joy of the Lord is our strength? Yeah, uh, for years, I've, uh, that, uh, yeah, it's a song. And I never understood it when I sang it. At least I knew I didn't know that. Um, and, I, and so a while ago, I put a bit of effort into trying, because for me, it's really important I understand, as in I've got some sort of 
cognitive understanding. Yeah, he's laughing at me because he just likes to experience and he can understand any time he likes. I can't experience until I do understand. Yeah. So I'm trying to work out how is the joy of the Lord strength for anything? Like that's just barking mad. It's just dumb. I don't even understand how his joy makes me strong. Like he's having that in him and I'm still standing here. And he's just going, oh, so joyful. Just, and I'm, I'm just going, life's still just as miserable as it was 10 seconds ago and you're joyful. How's that helping me? Until I understood. And my, having kids is what's done it. And it's not the actual, I didn't have them, obviously my wife did. But, and it, it's not just the birth because that just is traumatising, you need counselling. But it's, um, it's the stuff that happens as life goes on. And you see them fulfill their peacefully, joyfully, happily potential. You see them pursue and work hard at something, dedicated, maturing, and have a moment where they fulfill just this wonderful sense of, and you stand there and you're so proud in the best possible version of the word, and you are overwhelmed with joy. And when that happens for me, and it's happened many times with my, both of my kids, I cry. I cry because I did never seen my dad do that for me. But I cry because it's so overwhelming and I don't know what it means. It's just an undercurrent that overwhelms. And I realise that when I, if I could see dad doing that for me, it would be wind in my sails. And it would strengthen me to such a level that nothing could stop me. Do you get what I'm trying to say now? So the joy of the Lord truly is my strength because his pride and, and joyful exuberance in abundant love for me, especially as I'm pressing into the destiny and identity of what I'm designed for, is so empowering that nothing of the criticism of a negative world would have any say in comparison to that. So the joy of the Lord really has become my strength. But as per usual, I have to understand it before I can experience it. So let me uh, just take you through a few pictures and make a few comments. This is like staged sections through the movie to try and make a point. And hopefully the childlike person inside you can go, ah, oh, that's nice. And then like liquid into the chalk, like for the Colgate people who are old enough to understand what that means. Uh, it will get in and help you. Ah, Mufasa and Simba sitting there overlooking the kingdom. Shut up. I'm allowed to talk any way I like. Um, all criticisms go to Reuben, by the way. Um, all, all critique. So here we have a picture of Mufasa and Simba. Now, Simba is obviously the little one. And uh, I was going to bring out those points one by one, and it would have such a good effect as it came out. And, and I know you'd appreciate that, but um, somebody else has vetoed my slide design. Just as a word to the other presenters, whatever you produce won't work. <laughs> just so you know, just, a, just as a little word. I'm not looking over there anymore. I'm just not going to look there anymore. Look, there's four of them. It should be... No, anyway. So, we are made in the image of God. So you don't get to say you're anything less than that. So when you say, I can't, I'm hopeless, I'm useless, I'm this, you're saying either your God has to be that or you're telling yourself a lie. It's, it's that simple. So you either are made in the image of God or you're not. Now, we know that we are. We believe we are. All right? You are made not for performance. You are made for relationship and intimacy. So, in the, when, you know, when the Bible talks in the beginning, you know, God said, let us, let us, not let me, let us make them in our image. There is the Reformation sort of Protestant church history which talks about us being made outside of God like a tree or a fish or something else. And then there's the, before the Reformation, the perichoresis. This is theology. Perichoresis. I can't spell it, but I can say it. Practice five times. So proud of myself. Um... And the perichoresis of God is this um, triune God, three individuals, not the same of one substance. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit together are doing a dance. And so Father's got Son and Son's got Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit's got Dad. And they're looking at each other and they're going, oh, I love you. And the other one's going, no, I love you more. 
I love you. No, I love you. No, I really love you. Yeah, but, but I love you more. No, no, I love you more. And then this dance of perichoresis, which is never the same. So it's like a, it's a, the Jews talk about a circle being drawn, but it's never on the same line. So it's kind of a, it's a changing shape circle. So it's always unique and beautiful. Right? And in the midst of this, I love you, I love you, I love you, they made us in their image. So in the perichoresis dance, you are made to stay in the dance. And that's why you're a son and daughter. Because this is your home. Literally in the presence of God. You're designed for relationship and that's it. As soon as you're turned into a servant who has to work for approval, you're not in relationship. You're in a contract. So if you at any level feel like I must do this to please God, you're wrong. Can you please God by doing things as a son? Absolutely. That's the, you know, joy of the Lord fills the sails, all that stuff. That's doing stuff. But it says it's the fruit of the root of sonship being expressed in the fullness of you reaching your destiny, your identity. So you uh, you are made for relationship. Otherwise, he would say, Jesus would have said, not love commands, but do commands. They would have been the three great commandments of the New Testament are do commands. No, they're not. They're love commands. You should have all gone, what? (laughs) So, and in the context of that relationship, you are made for the opportunity of maturity. Does that make sense? By imitating God, follow me, learn to do what I do. That's the simpleness of discipleship. Imitate me. Don't get information. Do imitation. You learn to become like me. And you then, because you're like him, can't help but do what he does, which means you fulfill your divine purpose. It's that simple. Now, as a young cub, those of you who know the story know that Simba knew that he was the child of the king. But he did not know that he was not the king. (laughs) So he was a bit full of himself, a bit bolshy, a bit cocky, Bit sort of, hey, hey, look at me. Yeah, you gotta, one day I'm gonna be king and you're gonna have to do what I say. So he obviously didn't understand what king was, but anyway, that's beside the point. So he sort of started punting around with privilege and not realizing that he wasn't providing protection for anyone, someone else was providing it for him. And he wasn't providing provision for anybody, somebody else was providing it for him. And he didn't realize that having the name of an inheritance that he had yet to fill the boots of, that he wasn't fulfilling any purpose at all. So understanding maturity on the journey of sons, sons moving from glory to glory means the grace will have won the victory to get your heart to be in line for you to have the glory of the victory. You're not just moved from shininess to shininess, glory to glory. You move from a victory won to another victory won, and the glory of God is revealed. Done for you, agreed by you. Just, cause he's, just because he's put a you know, trillion dollars in your bank account doesn't mean you know how to take the withdrawal out. Sons know how to access, how to access heaven's benefits. And that's a transformation, a reformation of their identity. So this young cub ends up in the enemy's territory. Those of you who know the story know he goes to a place which is dark and shadowy and he's not meant to and he's certainly not meant to be on his own. Why? Because he is yet to fill the boots of his father and his father's the only one that can cope with that. So he takes Nala along with him and the hyenas sort of get around him and think, well, if we could kill him, we could stop the lineage of the king. And he says, I'm going to roar! I'm going to roar! And he goes, "Mm meow! Which tells us he may have had the title and the inheritance, but none of the power or capacity. Yet. And I need you to think about it. How are you going on this journey? So this, kids' stories are so good. They're so good. Because they give you permission to hear the truth and then maybe find out when Holy Spirit touches that and says that's you, um, or that you didn't have enough time to get defensive. That sucks, doesn't it? Never mind. Truth will set you free. And free is good, just so you know. So he he needed to learn humility. 
And I heard a phrase literally the other day. It was so good because I really don't really understand humility and anybody that knows me knows why. Um, Humility is not thinking less about yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. Thinking of others. I heard that and I went, oh my God. I love it when they're so simple because I can just about remember them. It's so good. And we know for Simba, he thought about himself a lot and didn't think about other people at all. And he's not thinking about people because he's a lion cub. (laughs) So he needed to mature by imitation and he needed to find out what his divine purpose was, not just the role of being king and having dominion over everything, but what does that actually mean? Now, as we know in the story, Scar, Uncle Scar, who's a tempter and accuser and a deceiver, he's a shocker, he wants the throne. Remind you of anybody. You know, in, you know, somebody that wants the position that we have, being sons and daughters of God, and wants to displace us from our position so that they can have the authority that we have. Like the temptation of Jesus when the enemy says to him, if you're the son of God, not... It's not about rocks and you know, tops of mountains and who's worshipping who. It's all about, do you know who you are? Because if you don't, you'll give it up. Guess what most people are doing? Giving up their identity privilege for a token. So in this story, sad story, Simba's dad goes to rescue him. We've got the, the wildebeest running through the valley. It's all a set up by Scar. Uh, Simba's done nothing but gets accused of causing his own father's death. He is full of shame. He's full of guilt. No, and, and, and it's fed. As he, every time he listens to it, the enemy feeds it and makes it, oh, what's your mum going to say? Oh, what's the, oh, nobody's, oh, they're going to be so upset with you. Oh, how could you possibly even look at yourself in the mirror having done that? You're, you're so disgraceful. Run away. Now, Holy Spirit's working in this room right now on people who recognise that's what they've done at certain points in their life. There's been something's gone wrong. There's an accusation over you. Now, it's not Dad. It's not your Heavenly Father, even though there'll be churches all over the world that will want to badge your failure as a reason why you're worthless. Heavenly Father's not doing it. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, it's not that big an issue to him. The biggest issue for him is, where is my kids? I want them back. Now, how we fulfill our destiny is an issue, but secondary. It's not primary. It's you're missing out. It's not I don't love you. It's not I want to condemn you. You're not in the old covenant. It's, there's a little bit of move on. So he abandons his birthright. It's his right. He abandons it. And he lives at a level of shame and embarrassment. And he travels to that land where Timon and Pumbaa, you know the story, Warthog and Meerkat. Gotta love Meerkats. Gotta love them. Just, it's everybody, you go to the zoo, you can see every animal but the Meerkats. There's always a bunch of people wanting to see him do this. That, I don't know why that's so amazing, but anyway, it is. And in that place, he's full of depression anxiety, uh, worry, and he's told the language, akuna matata, it means don't worry for the rest of your days, it's a trouble-free philosophy, now stop it. (laughs) Now, in the context of this movie, what it is, is escape all genuine engagement with the reality of the frustrations and challenges of life. It's not don't worry. It's not carefree. It's living without care. It's careless. I refuse to care. Because that's what's actually happening in the, in the ecosystem of this. I won't care about anything, therefore I have nothing to worry. Because I'm careless. I care at all. Now, we can't afford to do that because we're made in the image of God. And remember that passage that says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you? Well, that word is misused. It says, cast all your anxieties on him, which are worries that cause you trouble. Because he generally is full of care for you. And they're two different words in that. Now, why English translate them the same? Who knows? Just silly. 
but it doesn't mean what we think it means, which means God's full of care. And if you're made in his image, so are you. So you can't afford to be care less, because if you care less, you're not imitating your father. Does that make sense? Okay. He moves towards self-indulgence in a very small world of influence. He is coerced into a role with a lie. Do you remember the story? Meerkat thinks having a lion as a friend might make their life better. Never tells him that. He's coerced into doing the provision and protection role he was designed for, but for two, not for everyone, and into a lie. It's a total deception. And it's a humongous compromise on his true identity. He's a de- he indulges himself, he's abandoned his purpose, he's recruited by others to do a little vision, which is pointless. Here's the clue, and this is what I thought about as I thought about it. You can't avoid, avoid service. You'll always serve something or someone. You can't avoid it. There's no such existence. You're either serving yourself or a small vision or a lie. You might as well serve the truth. But you can't avoid service. You will serve something. It's unavoidable. And in the process, you make lots of compromises. And a lion that's designed to eat meat, eat bugs. Now, appropriately, he's disgusted. (laughs) But compromises... Because to get what he's designed for, he has to address the lies of his past. He lives with limitations that are self-imposed by agreement. He lives less satisfied and less fulfilled. His potential is lost. Now, it's interesting with the food thing. The reason I I paused on that one was Jesus talks to his disciples when he's, I think it's either the woman at the well, I think he's, they go off to get food and come back and he says, I have food that you do not know about. Now, I'm pretty sure he didn't say it like that, but I'm imagining it's that important that you should have a tonal thing to it. I have food that you do not know about. What food? Where's the hamburger store? We didn't know. We passed it. We went the wrong road. My food is to do the will of my father. Oh, interesting. Interesting. That service in the right direction is nourishing. Nourishing. He wouldn't have used the word food if it wasn't nourishing. Fully filled. Fulfilled. Purpose. It's all coming together, really. I feel really good about it. (laughs) That was spontaneous. I appreciate that. (laughs) Ah. And I just like fart jokes, so here's one. Those bubbles aren't there from a natural pool. They're from a pool of nature coming from another place. We serve our desires. So, and the Bible talks about this regularly. When we abandon our identity, we gratify our desires. It talks about that. All right? I don't have to say too much about it. I'm not one of making a big deal. So we serve our desires. Our purpose is small. Our allegiances and alliances are small. Our influence is small. And others pay for our choice. Now, you might go, well, that's not fair. Oh, nobody else is paying for my dumb choice of self-indulgence. Wait until you see the rest of the story. Oh, my goodness. Then he meets a spiritual, in this case, baboon, which may have a reflection on people that are spiritual. I'm not sure. Crazy monkeys. And he is confronted by a different perspective. He has a perception that he killed his dad. It's his fault. A perception, which is often a lie. But perceptions are more powerful than truth. What your perception is will be what you live by. Truth won't matter. And then he's confronted by the spiritual voice, like a prophetic voice, if you like, that makes a different declaration from a perspective that aligns with the truth. We'll we'll talk about this tomorrow at the introduction, just to give you a little clue. And then he goes on this, Dad's alive! And he looks into the pool, and that you are made in my image hits him in the face. Which reminds us of that passage where it says, people look into the mirror of who they are and when they walk away they forget they forget what they forget who they are and he has forgotten and in the mirror of the pool of water 
He sees what he was made in the image of and from and therefore for. And now humility and pride and self-indulgence are all being processed. Because he's thought about himself a lot and about others less. And he's lived a lie outside of his own identity. He has now become the protector of two, not the king of a kingdom. He lives on food that he's not designed for when the thing that will fulfill him most... You know the story. And then he goes on the journey back with Queen Nala. Gotta love Nala. Sort of like husbands and wives. It's so annoying. Again, why do they always know what you don't know? Just don't laugh. It's not funny. It just happens to me way too much. (laughs) So, you know how I said, and everyone else pays? Well, when you're not fulfilling your identity, the world around you. Now, the Bible talks about it in Romans 8, where it talks about the whole creation groans for the sons of God to be made manifest. Manifest means living it, princes becoming kings. doesn't mean I saw a picture of a son of God. Or somebody said they were a son of God. That doesn't mean nothing. It means when they're actually manifest, actually living out the protection, the provision, the authority, the power, the hyenas are running, the whole world suffering. And you see that in this story when you see the enemy running Pride Rock and the devastation of the mismanagement of stewardship. Most of you remember the story. And that's what he goes back to. And this is what princes to kings do. We return to the land devastated by the work of the enemy. And just like Jesus, who destroyed the work of the enemy, we go about destroying the work of the enemy. We go about terraforming. We go about reforming. We go about reformation. In reality, in soul reformation, in mind reformation, in body reformation, in culture, in family, in country. There's nothing that's not touched by reformation. And it takes time. So we have to steward our identity. And the process for us of that is, and we've used this sort of idea in the past, until Christ is formed in us. That's what the last few conferences have been. That's been the springboard we've used to remind us of what the goal is. As he is in the world, so am I. You'll do what I've done in greater things. When you walk into your inheritance, when you know your father and you know who you are and you move from technon, which is kids at the feet of the father, to huios, which is the apprentice learning the family trade, to huiothemiso, where the father says, you are my son, which means you're running the family business. And it, you can't, You don't get to put that hand on your own head and say, you are my son, as if you've got the role, because you don't. Dad tells you when you're ready for each stage. And it's a, a stage of maturity. And you know what happens? You can tell when you think of yourself less and you think of others more. And, and like, for me, I know, so if you're sitting there and you're going, oh, wow, you must be amazing because you know all this stuff and oh, you're telling me and I'm so touched and I feel so humble and inferior because, you, oh, I just realised there's so many gaps in my spiritual journey. And I'm saying I'm on it too. My journey of looking for title and position and qualification and achievement and success to fill the aching hole of a lack of a dad that's proud of me and understanding the peace of being in the father's arms unconditionally without any strings attached where my failure never made up never meant I was loved less and my success never meant I was loved more that culture of my heart is a work in progress And those around me, like Reuben and Luke and Matthew and Rebecca, they can speak reams to what they know about what God has done and how much space there is for God to do more. And it's not a put-down. It's not a put-down at all. There's room for Dad 
to bring grace that's militant, to see his glory triumphant. And if I get it, I can give it away. But I can't give away what I don't have. So I won't pretend I'm all there because it'd be a lie. And I'd like you not to pretend either. It's all for the purpose of multiplication. It's interesting. You know what seeds are designed for? The next generation. You know what everything in creation is designed to do naturally? Multiply. You know what the only species on the planet that gets in the road of that is? Just look around the room. It's not going to be hard to tell. Humanity. We're the only ones that get in the road of multiplication. We multiply bad things really quickly. It's, it's something like this. It's in a proverb, I'm pretty sure. And it's a principle of multiplication. Those who sow a wind reap a whirlwind. Now, it works for good or evil. Who knows the sins of the fathers multiplying down the hill and... Yeah, we all do. So it works for evil. But it's, who knows it was only designed for good? Only designed for good. And if we understand, hence... You have no idea how hard it was for me to write this. In my culture, and I mean the economy of organised religion, you have to have a doctorate to write a book. You can't be the underachiever in the theological school and write a book. You're a, several swear words, embarrassment. You're an underachiever and you're not worth listening to. All right? Now, you can preach all you like because they can't catch you for that. They can hunt you down, try to catch you, but you can move. But you write a book, you've written it down. You've pegged your colours. You've got your flag. They can find you. Yeah. So when I wrote the book, and there were a few people in my sort of clan, the other clan I'm in, and now what do you reckon their reaction was? Laughter. Oh, here you've written a book. <laughs> now, there's a part of me, the not mature, well-formed part of me, the highly reactive, gets really angry, really easy part. You guys saw a little bit of it last night. <laughs> the music was really loud and my wife was awake and I had to come over and tell him to stop and I could have been nice about it and I apologised because I wasn't. I do that publicly. And I did what I did privately, so that's worth more, just so you know. <laughs> But that part of me wants to lash out. Because when you've been attacked a lot, you either learn, there's, what is it? Fight, flight, and frozen? Guess, one I, guess, guess which one I do? Matthew, which one do I do? Fight. Fight. <laughs> Fight, yeah. I come out of the corner like a scolded cat. Like, literally. No boxing gloves, bare knuckles. You can, you can, I'm not going to try to be soft about this. I'm going to belt the tripe out of here. I'm going to make you hurt enough that you won't come back near me again in the future. This is a form of brutal self-protection. Let me tell you, it's not in the Bible and you're not meant to do it. It's not, a, it's not a biblical. I'm not trying to teach you this. I'm confessing. Does it, you see the difference? I don't want to glorify the work of the enemy. Although it is a little bit funny, eh? It is, it is, because people laugh, so it's got to be. But don't do it. I'm not teaching you to do this. Why would I come out of the corner like a scalded cat to their ignorance? Because I want their approval. Why would I need their approval if I know they don't agree with me to start with? Because performance is one of the pillars of my identity. Uh, I need to go back to the first slide and go through all the way through this teaching and do it myself. So why did I write the book then if there was... Like, I fail at the English language. Not at Australian. I am very competent Australian, I'll have you know. Other people could learn to be Australian in the vernacular by not li looking at anything I write, but certainly listening to me. I've got gum leaves growing out of my shirt neck. When I wrote essays at Bible college... 50% of it would come back with red marks all over it. 
I would lose a grade and a half doing my degree just on the incompetence of my spelling and grammar. Can you believe that? that now, this is probably not encouraging anybody to read the book, which is a, probably a self, self-promoting s- stupidity. Um, so that, I, I had other people check the book out, and on every page there were 15 to 20 mistakes, and they fixed them. So, whew, great rescue. Great rescue, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> So it was fixed. I had it proofread by four people and they all found problems after each other included because everybody's got an eye for a certain thing. And there are still mistakes in there that I found, four. It's interesting, isn't it? It's downhill, yeah. And the next session is on how to do proofreading properly. No. Um, <laughs> um, why did I write the book then? If I'm faced with an ego that needs affirmation from the people around me to say that it's good enough and if I write the book now I'll give you a clue God bless John and Edwina God bless them just bless you so much (laughs) these two beautiful people beautiful people just so they don't even know how nice they are beautiful people we, I was just had the joyous luxury of sitting in the environment of your, just where you live and move, and then you, you attended some of the stuff that we were cracking on about, and, and you had a breakthrough, and I think I saw the joy of the Lord thing, because I felt it in me when I saw you get a breakthrough, and it just blew me away. And then people kept asking me, where do we, where do we find out about this? And I'd say, well, do what I did. It's really easy. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle, and it's in a helicopter, and you just open the door, and it's blown out all over Melbourne, and you just go and hunt and search and find, and then you work out how it all fits together, and then you write the book, and it's hopeless, and then you pout for six months, and then you rewrite it because you listen to God, not yourself, and it comes out okay. Just do that. And I don't know why, but everybody thought that was profoundly inadequate. That was a very unhelpful explanation on how to find out. They said, well, why couldn't you just write something down? Mm, I don't think I can do that. I can talk about it all day with marbles in my mouth. But, so why did I write the book? Multiplication. Multiplication. If one of the many ideas that got it, now all of them are God's ideas, let me be really clear, I think I'm smart because I can understand it, but I didn't write it and I didn't make it. I just understood it. That's all. I'll take that, scribbled around a bit, getting the thoughts on a page. That's all. I didn't make the design. I just talked about it. But if you get one of the ideas that's in this, you'll start maturing. You'll start not to be the punty little cub that thinks it's everything. You'll start to be the king at the background that multiplies something. Now, one of the biggest joys for me, and, and I steward this. This is, my, this is something that God has given to me, and I steward it and steward it, and I try to live it, and I go on that heart journey of being open to what God is saying to me about it, and I do that more than anything. Because if he's given you something, you should mine it until there's no gold left. Right? And then have it and live it every day. But one of the joys has been is watching Matthew and Luke and and Reuben and Rebecca and, and all the ones that we influence get their own perspective adjustment around this and just go on that journey where the uniqueness of where we need to come into the fullness of who we are is spelt out in a new canvas on that life and in, on this life and on another life and then the language of it changes a little as the uniqueness of the blessing of the grace being militant to produce the glory of God that you would become the sons and daughters of God who change the desolate world around you now nothing works without it nothing because all we are is working for approval nothing works out without knowing who you are nothing nothing that's why jesus did so much work to get you to call god dad that's why he did so much work to tell you that you have a kingdom inheritance that's why when the lawyer who knew all about the law, says, what must I do to inherit? He told him a story that had nothing to do with doing to inherit because you can only be born to a birthright, that's inheritance. You can do nothing 
to get a birthright. And you're not grafted back into God's family from some other God that abandoned you. That's nonsense. Your dad has been looking for his sons and daughters back at the table. This is, so, identity gives you intimacy, and intimacy leads to, hopefully, to maturity. Maturity leads to inheritance, and inheritance leads to destiny, because you're living out the design of who you are, not doing a job. You can't help yourself. Why did I write the book? In the end, I couldn't help myself. It has been the most dedicated time period in terms of intention. I, think, I feel like it was Holy Spirit, to be honest. I would get up early and write and write and edit and write. I would get up late and write and edit. And then I would read the book backwards and edit and write and change. And then I would, and everything I did, unlike my talks, was to make it shorter. So it was more digestible, more accessible. A launch pad, not everything. Not a concordance an invitation into the presence of a dad that says, this is my son, this is my daughter, and I don't know, you just, like, it melts me every time. I'll tell you the story of the Lord's Prayer just quickly because it's, it's nice. And that was the first thing that God showed me because he, he told me to talk about sonship and I talked about sonship in, in my ministry for a month, about a year earlier or two years earlier. And, of course, a month is a long time to be talking about one topic. And so I said to God, it's obvious that I've really covered that really well because I've you know, done a degree, I know how to look these things up, and I've done a really good job at it. And then someone gave me a prophetic word, who was a good friend of mine, who I trusted, so they're the only ones that get away with it. And he said, oh, I was uh, praying, about, uh, praying for you the other day, and I said, oh, it must have been ours. Anyway, he said, no, it wasn't that long. Um, and then he said, um, I felt like the Lord saying he, he wants you to talk about sonship. And of course, being the open and humble person I am, I went, well, I talked about that for a month before, and no, 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 no. And they said, well, what's wrong with him? What, are they listening? I've already done it. So obviously I was teachable. And I said, I'm busy. I'm talking about this other thing he told me to talk about, which I really believed he did. I'll do it when I'm finished. I'll think about it. And like every good prophetic word, you always you don't just throw them away. If you're not sure, you put it on the shelf and you let it ruminate and you come back to it and you test it. So I got to the end of the series of what I was doing, which was obviously profoundly wonderful. And, um, uh, and then I said to Dad, what do you want to do next? And he said, oh, have a look on the shelf. And I went, oh, that's right. That guy said such and such. And here, here is the humble, very teachable version of me. I've already done that. And he went, so what do you want me to do? So I want you to do that. Well, if you want me to do that, you're going to have to tell me what you want me to say that, aren't you? And that's basically how I said it, which was not really that teachable, to be honest. I, I really didn't, even at the time, I knew, because as soon as it came out of my sort of soul, I knew God was going to go, really? That's how we want to deal with this? <laughs> but it was already too late. And I'm fairly honest as a rule, and I can't lie with God. He sort of gets it as it is, even if it's really dumb. And uh, he went, here's the beauty of it. I actually think that was his preference. Like I said, you're going to have to tell me what you want me to say then. And like if, if you were God and you wanted someone to talk on a topic, the only thing you'd want him to do is say what you want him to say. So this stupid petulance of mine actually worked seamlessly and it was only after that I realized that it did see how good is God he'll use any yes that you give him even if it's a stupid one like I just seriously this book is the fruit of a stupid yes and so then he takes me and I said so at this stage I'm literally I'm not going to read nothing I'm not going to look at nothing I'm not going to work at all I'm not going to put any effort into it all you're going to have to tell me what you're going to say and if I've got nothing for Sunday when I get there and they all look at me and they say Bruce what is the word for today I'll say well I asked God and he said nothing so here you go nothing I told him yeah it was going to be that petulant that pathetic and so I said so I'm moving through the week, just saying, okay, Dad, what do you want me to say? And he said, I want you to, I want you to talk about the Lord's Prayer. And I went, really? <laughs> I thought we were doing sonship, sonship. And he said, no, I want you to talk about the Lord's Prayer. And I said, okay. So then I got to a point where I was going to sit down and do some reflection. He said, so re just read the, read the Lord's Prayer. 
And so I went, okay, our father heard, stop. Really? He said, start again, start again. Okay. Our father heard, no, stop. Really? Do you want to say it slower? Oh, father. Stop. Oh. Now I'm curious. I go, why do you want me to stop there? And everyone knows God is Father, and we've said it a thousand times, like all the songs and all the rest of it. But he knew my heart didn't know it. My head did. My heart didn't know it. And then he showed me a picture, a video in my head. And, and, and he helped me to ask the question, the right question, which is, why do you want me to know that? And then he showed me. He said, why do you think, why do you think this got in the book? You know, the Word of God. Woo! It's all sacred. If it's so sacred, how did it get in the book, this bit? Well, it must be important. Bingo. He didn't do that. That's me. Um, although it would be kind of nice if he did. I'd probably enjoy that. Um, then we get to the, he said, so why is it there? So then I read the story. And the disciples asked him, teach us to pray. And he said, so why do you think they asked him to teach them to pray? I said, well, the disciples, they have to do what their Lord says. And he said, no. I said, why? He said, have a think about it. When they pray, when he prays. And I oh, when he prays, boom, heaven touches earth. Things are put right. When they pray, fizz. Why did they ask him, teach us to pray? Well, they want to be able to go, boom, not fizz. I went, oh, that's pretty cool. I could agree with that. I want to go, boom, when I pray, not fizz. And then he showed me the video. So I see the disciples asking him, teach us to pray. And he walks up to one of them and he puts his arm around his shoulder. And he said, I want you to call my dad your dad. And after that, nothing works unless you start with he's your dad. Not the rest of the blah, 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 doesn't work. That's why he said stop. He said, none of the Lord's Prayer works until the first bit's true. It's layered upon layered upon layered on wonderful principle. Until you can have, until you can get that when you come to pray, it's a relationship. It's not a butler in the sky or a policeman in the sky. It's a dad who's intimate and personal. And like in that sort of kid's show, I will never leave you. I'll never give up on you. I'll never settle for less. And so I see this moment. And of course, for all of us, it's different. Father relationships, complicated. So when he says to him, call my dad your dad, iceberg, heart full of dad issues, heart full of dad beatings and bad language and disappointment, never loved you, never proud of you, you're a failure. Ooh, this soup of that, don't want to do that. Until you realise he's not like my dad. My dad's meant to be like him. So I'm putting the language backwards. So then go on the and so go on the journey. And you can't have a dad unless you're willing to be his kid. And that's that simple. And it, and it just unfolds in layers of grace that's militant for you. So good. I have ignored our timing completely. Oh, it's, it's their fault, actually. No, no, all complaints go to Reuben. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to put a. <laughs> so. If I was to say to you, there are, and we could maybe post these questions somewhere, because I think we've reached our time. Yeah. Um, our divine identity is our birthright. To realise our inherent potential requires a heart alignment and agreement. So, if you've been looking at this, and the Holy Spirit's been having a little wrestle with your heart, and loving on you enough to believe in more for you than you do for yourself... And this is our foundation, remember, because what's going to come from the rest of my brothers and sisters is going to talk about what you do when this is right.
okay? So this, we're just resetting, reminding our reformation, which leads to everything else. Maybe you could ask yourself the question, which sort of fits with the different pictures that I put up there. Um, are you young and innocent sitting with the Father, don't know what you don't know? Are you young and full of yourself, full of your position, and think you're really significant, but no power or authority to do anything? Are you puffed up with a, re and with a reality check of your position with no power, the hyena story? Are you feeling guilty and ashamed of the mistakes, real or imagined, from the accuser? Are you, are you avoiding a significant life and settling for care free, really care less when you're meant to be careful? Are you feeding on things that are less than satisfying? In other words, you don't feel fulfill, fulfilled or satisfied in life. Guess why? You're feeding on things you're not designed for. Living a life of ease, wonder, uh, avoiding challenges and significance, or being confronted by, confronted with my true identity, facing going home. In other words, facing becoming who I am. Which I think is part of the uh, prince to king thing, to be honest. Are you uh, living my identity and restoring my environment? The whole world groans for the return of Christ. The whole creation groans for the sons and daughters of God to be made manifest. Why? Because there's a desolation at the hands of the destroyer. Or are you multiplying my blessings to the next generation? So these would be questions that I think it'd be worth reflecting on because... There is a, I believe there's a truth. Some people move quickly, are early adapters, some are slow adapters. It's irrelevant because it's not about your importance, it's just about a process. But I know one thing is true. You can't do the next step until you've done that step you're in. And sometimes, because of our appetite to be significant, we won't tell ourselves the truth and we'll pretend we're somewhere we're not and it fails and then we deceive ourselves or avoid. And, that, and that's complicated. And I understand it because I've done it myself. But the best thing to do is say, Holy Spirit, where am I? Because I want to grow real so that when I get there, I can persevere and I can see your, you know, your power, your work, fulfill its purposes in me. Some people move quickly. Some people move slowly. The only thing that matters is are you becoming who you actually truly are? Let's pray. How good are you, Dad? Come on. How good are you, Jesus? Oh, I think you are so cool. How good are you, Holy Spirit? Never leave me. You always believe in me. Whether I'm looking at you or looking away. You never give up on me. You never give me anything less than your best. You never show me anything less than the truth that leads to freedom. You manifest in me, on me, and through me, always to do what Jesus was doing. How good are you? How good are you? And then all three of you are dancing around me saying, I'm made for this. Saying, how good are you? Saying to each one of us, how good are we? Become who you're made to be. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. Carpet bomb us. Carpet bomb us with that relentless love that never settles for less than who we're designed to be. So, Father, we, we pray for every word, everything that comes during these three days, that there'll be a demolition of anything that sets itself up above the whole knowledge of God and an establishment of this beautiful, wonderful, intimate relationship until the whole earth sees your glory. Amen. Amen. Ha! <laughs> awesome. Can we give him another big hand? Beautiful. Thank you. The, the day sessions are created with workshop style so that we can think through some of the things that we're being spoken to. Uh, so you've got some questions there that you can think through and mull over and uh, don't put in your notepad and leave it for the next time you forget. 
because the, the next time that you think that you need to check something and we sometimes forget about it, but I think I like that part about the heart issue. You know, we need to work on the heart issue. We hear this stuff, but every time we hear something new, it's just layers upon layers. So um, just for a few minutes before Pops Matthew comes up to share the next session, would you go and speak to someone and say, here's one thing I've learned. So for me, one thing I've learned is to remember that it's the heart issue, not what we think, but what we feel and what we're hearing and under the iceberg again, just remind, reminding us of that. Would you go to two people or one person and just for about five minutes, just speak to someone, say, what's one thing I learned from the session today that would be impactful? Yeah. Okay, well, there you go.